Welcome back to the third panel of Synesthetic Syntax. Uh, we will have three presentations and we do a short Q&A after each presentation. The panel is entitled or focused on liveness and procedural animation. And the first presentation is uh, Synesthetic Syntax, Hutlerized 4D, Expanded Stereoscopic Abstract Animation Live Performance. Max Hutler is an artist, researcher, curator, uh, who works with abstract uh, animation since many, many years. Uh, his uh, um, work, animated shorts, have been awarded at many, many festivals and got also a uh, honorary mention uh, here at Ars Electronica and was screened at Deep Space. So the stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to mention how excited I am uh, to, to be here today with this performance as I've never really done a standalone uh, performance about my presentation uh, practice before ever. So I either play live or I talk uh, about something else. So being included in this forum on this year's theme of the art of performance feels extra special um, since much of my work qualifies as expanded animation but also as performance. So in my work, uh, I focus on abstract and experimental animation. I create fixed films and video installations, linear structures, often functioning as loops, but still fixed. I put a lot of uh, attention into the details. Everything is micro-edited and super synchronized. At the same time, I rely on iteration and experimentation rather than script and storyboarding. So there's a big element of quote-unquote improvisation in my fixed film work. Iterative improvisation, trial and error, happy accidents. But this improvisation always uh, happens within a set of strict rules, conceptual or aesthetic, in terms of animation techniques, uh, of softwares used, etc. So for each work, um, I tend to, to limit the the parameters with each, with win, which, within which I work, but then try to push within these constraints to create uh, something interesting. So for example, here, collision, um, I'm working with the, the colors of flags and only after effects, very limited animation. Here on Anad, I worked with only stop motion on a, with a fixed camera where the whole film kind of transforms and folds the space from one camera angle. Um, heaven and Hell, I work with ideas of mirroring and endless loops um, on, on, on two screens and so on. Um, my work explores the space between abstraction and representation, between glimpses of meaning and non-objective meaninglessness to open up thinking spaces, but also visceral experiences, meditative states, um, something that kind of works kind of on a level of music more than, more than film, uh, often um, through motion, color, and sound. So yeah, generally there's a strong connection to music and sound and to visual music, i.e. ideas around a musical structuring of visual elements whose sum becomes more than the parts. So early on I felt that performing live also made a lot of sense. Music visuals, visual music, you know, creating something in the studio and then going out and, and performing it or performing something. Uh, here, some other works which are kind of more expanded. Um, so yes, um, when I started playing live, um, during my uh, postgraduate studies at the Royal College of Art in London, um, it was first and foremost an enjoyable but slightly throwaway counterpoint to my uh, animation practice. Something to get me out of the studio and amongst humans. Animators are very sad people you know, who are at home in dark rooms laboring, as you all know. Uh, so being in another dark space together with people um, is, can be quite exciting. I started VJing in clubs. Uh, using found footage, VJ software, effects, Flickr, video feedback. VJing is a kind of unnoticed, underappreciated 
art film, often, oftentimes, you know, moving wallpaper, um, which sort of helped me to become less uh, precious about my work, embrace imperfection, and also use it as a way of, of testing out ideas and just kind of like, bah, you know, being like more free about things rather than sort of super OCD. So this was, became a nice kind of balance uh, or, or counter, counterpoint to what I was doing. So the first more succinct, uh, quote unquote, audiovisual performance came uh, a couple of years later when the London International Animation Festival together with Animate, which is now Animate Projects in the UK, commissioned myself and fellow uh, late animator Run Rake, no, late fellow animator Run Rake, um, to do performances on the topic of remixing the past. This was in, in 2008. So for my performance, I revisited my own family history, uh, my childhood growing up in a hippie commune with my dad in his 20s playing music with Krautrock band Kran, which was kind of documented in Super 8 film. So I took those things, uh, digitized them, used uh, my dad's music, early songs um, from, from their band as a, as a soundtrack to create an improvised footage. So it's qu quite an interesting jumping off point for exploring live performance and music, uh, but also kind of my own upbringing with, within that, uh, in, in a sense. Where is my... Okay, um, so over the uh, years that followed, I collaborated with other like-minded animated performers, uh, such as Noriko Okaku or Robert Seidel, um, on different performances, often also in film festival contexts. Ah, there it is. Um, and I guess we were interested in taking our word, work on the road uh, and seeing how that feeds back in, into the work, into the, you know, the animation work. And as, as we were going along, we are exploring the possibilities of, of video mixers, like the Edirol for V4, uh, cam cameras using, using uh, video feedback, uh, with Noriko combining drawn animation with sort of graphic, my graphic abstraction, with Robert uh, combining data moshing, uh, with with my abstraction, uh, playing with different formats, uh, such as a three-screen setup for a semi-narrative performance with Noriko, uh, all really kind of fun fun things, and and always sort of on this you know between between the festival world and and uh, and, and performance and between film and and liveness. So then um, the Hatlerizer came about in an effort to streamline my sprawling set up into a co coherent visual system that while real time would be a bit closer conceptually to my fixed film practice, i.e. a system that allowed me to improvise freely within a set of predefined rules. How free jazz musicians play with certain constraints or how in one of my films I would explore one idea within limited aesthetic or software parameters. The first iteration of the Hatlerizer was developed uh, in the summer of 2010, together with audiovisual performer and uh, 4V, VVV uh, developer Sune Peterson, and we've been updating it ever since. The name Hatlerizer came from Sune, it's how he named the folder when he started working on it, and being the narcissistic egomaniac that I am, it, you know, I was like, yeah, let's go with it. <laughs> um, the the basis of the Hatlerizer is an image strip, uh, which looks like that. Can be anything, but this is one of them. Um, and it's inspired by the scroll paintings of Hans Richter and Viking Egeling uh, from, the, from the early 20s, which were precursors, precursors to their abstract animation films. The scroll paintings are read linearly by the viewer. And though they are still, they suggest time and movement. In a similar sense, the, the image strip of the Hatlerizer also is still is read linearly by a virtual camera it passes under, thereby displaying its shapes in motion. 
The speed, scale, and direction of this movement can be controlled by a hardware controller, such as the Behringer BRC2000, uh, which I often use. Then a second layer of modification um, is it, this image strip running through uh, different types of visual mirroring, horizontal, vertical, randomized, kaleidoscopic, and these parameters can then also be animated over time. Additional parameters that are important elements are flicker and different types of video feedback, i.e. like a normal video feedback and a uh, edge detect uh, feedback, which creates these kind of like very organic kind of uh, flowing structures and more recently also glows. So uh, very quickly it can become quite complex with a lot of functionality, but also within very defined boundaries. As such, the system is really good for live uh, improvisation uh, to and with music or, or sound art, as it allows for instant audiovisual conversation where I can react instantly to sound, sound events and if my sonic counterpart is improvisationally inclined, they can react to me. That, that's always the most interesting to have real kind of, you know, audiovisual kind of back and forth. Over the years, I've played with a range of experimental musicians and sound artists like Matthias Kispert, Mikhail Kerikis, Mehmet Jan Erzer, and most importantly, a Spanish Game Boy musician Vesperon, who uh, created a, a customized soundtrack uh, for, for Hatler Riser. I'm um, going to play a very little clip, maybe. This has some sound. I'll leave it there. Um, I also play uh, live with music acts, like uh, here with uh, Idiotape, um, where I improvise to the music, but they ignore me, which is also fine, because um, I can improvise. So um, Now, Hatlerizer um, has been kind of even sort of iterating also over the years. And the latest version, uh, 4D or 4.D, which is basically 4.0, but with f four dimensions, um, incorporates uh, two big additions, optical sound and uh, uh, stereoscopy. So uh, through the addition of optical sound, I can create my own soundscape in real time. This was inspired by experiments of animated or drawn or graphical sound by artists like uh, Norman McLaren. In uh, my setup, the luminance values of the image are, are red, comparable to how an optical soundtrack is red to create sound from a black and white visual slash optical soundtrack. Yeah, so you can see the sound, the visual soundtrack running there and it's red back and transformed back into sound and in the same way, um, I have my image which, which is sonified uh, instantly. So the other um, important kind of big new addition is um, stereo. 
which means it can be um, uh, seen with through glasses and basically uses a simple uh, depth displacement uh, and for splitting the image into left and right eye based on luminance values. Um, and it creates not really a 3D um, space, but it creates some depth and it, that really pulls the audience in a bit more. It makes it, it's still a flat thing, but it just pulls you in. It makes it more immersive. So it's, it's really, I, I like it a lot. Um, yeah, so in this one, the optical sound is there, but it's also combined with a, a, a pre-made pre soundtrack. Um, I'm not going to play any more clips because I want to keep the time. Um, so, in contrast to my fixed animation works, which are meticulously micro-edited, in Hatlerizer performances, live improvisation with all its flaws and imperfections is foregrounded and becomes perceivable for the audience. To me, it's a very different kind of engagement from a film work, and the audience's expectation is generally also different as they come with the expectation of partaking in the liveness of the experience. This liveness is also always a negotiation between the performer, i.e. myself, and the ghost in the machine. Certain parameters run on LFOs, i.e. low frequency oscillation, i.e. predefined curves to keep uh, movements going. Uh, I can control these movements, but they also keep running if not interfered with. Small adjustments can often lead to big changes. The whole system can be seen as a visual instrument, a visual instrument, which also needs to be learned and mastered. I'm not a surfer, but I imagine playing uh, live a bit like surfing waves. Sometimes they crash, sometimes they carry you and the audience to unprecedented heights or highs, actually, uh, hopefully, before they crash again. <laughs> um, while my live work w at first was very different from my film practice, it has become closer to it. I've also started, it, also, I've also, it has also started to feed back into my film. So I've made, um, for example, I've recorded things live and then edited them into a fixed film. Uh, this is a film called Plus from 2019, which is just a recording of a live performance, but it works really well and, it, you know, sort of the, the liveness becomes kind of channeled and micromanaged again. And then um, my most recent piece, uh, OS, which I finished yesterday, uh, basically, um, is created in After Effects, is, is hand animate, uh, you know, digitally animated, but is then fed through uh, uh, 4V to create optical sound from the image and also to add further complications by um, sort of performing over it live to create some video feedbacks and things which then in turn kind of influence the sound again. So that, yeah, bit of liveness feeding back into the, into the fixed work. So uh, we've come full circle and I'm done. Thank you. That's all I have for today. Thank you, Max. Right on time. So we have time for uh, Q and A's. I will start uh, with a very short question, as it's uh, Hutlerized 4D. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the stereoscopic vision? So you are an expert on binocular rivalry, so you did uh, some experiments already. So is there, uh, you mentioned there is not really a depth, but it immerses you in, in terms of uh, what? It, it, it does, how? yeah, it does create depth uh, through a, a depth map displacement, uh, which is subtle but effective. It and and that allows it. It just pulls you in a bit more. It just it just makes the whole and thereby makes the whole experience also added with together with the optical sound more trippy. Yeah, it just pulls you in that bit more without it becoming a three D performance. Okay, there is depth inside, so this is not um, um, uh, a mixture of. Um artifacts created by binocular rivalry? There's, um, I'm, 
let's say in the version 4.d1, there will be some rivalry as well. This is, um, yeah, we're working on this to have some color rivalry. Okay. But only color, color, only color rivalry. So this is, cool. yeah. Brigitte. Thank you, Max. I can ask you a quick question. So you've just said that you love the control over your animations and your, manima your animations just kind of animate, um, little, emanate micromanagement. And I'm thinking about the researcher, I don't know if she's here today, but that we spoke to the other day who was talking about failure and studying failure. So I was wondering how it feels for you as a performer if something goes wrong. Does it, do, does it really freak you out? Yeah. But but then also in my films, like when I'm working on a film, there's failure all the time. Things always, you know, I produce a lot of stuff that doesn't end up in the film, but then I edit it. And then in the performances, I can't do that. So yeah, I, I find that painful. But at the same time, um, you know, I've seen a lot of performances that are not really performances that are so time locked that actually someone basically just presses play and then you have your MIDI that triggers everything and, and it's, li you know, it's live but not really live. And to me that's sort of beside the point, it becomes boring. So, so putting myself at risk in front of an audience also gives me that adrenaline rush to like try and do my best and pr hope and pray. So it kind of makes it exciting and I think that that's also more exciting for an audience to be able to go. Yeah, I went to see Max Hadler, and it was shit. <laughs> okay, there is time for a last question, Erwin. Yeah, um, can you go a bit more into depth um, on your collaboration with the musicians, especially those where you are like not improvising to the music, but the mus musicians also um, improvise to your visuals or um, vice versa. Yeah, I mean, this is it's usually rare because, yeah, if, if it's musicians who play songs, then they will not look right. at the screen, you know, they're like, yeah. Um, if, it's, if it's people who are interested in, in more like sound art or experimental musicians who are interested in, in, in improvisation also with other musicians, you know, sometimes they get into the mode of actually looking at the screen and, and responding to it. And that's obviously the most kind of rewarding for me because then also I can't fuck up that much because, you know, if I mess up, they will take it as a cue, you know, for the next thing or it, it sort of becomes more, um, yeah, like an, an exchange, audio visual exchange, which in, when it goes well, I think is, can be really powerful. Max, thank you so much for uh, this very interesting insight into your also um, vivid uh, collaboration between musicians in live performance and as well. You showed the link to uh, the animated shorts. Um, that, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We move on. Uh, our next speaker is Johannes de Jong. He's an internationally recognized artist and filmmaker who works at the intersection of computational and material processes. His moving images uh, have been exhibited internationally at uh, many venues. Uh, I just mentioned uh, B3, uh, Frankfurt, or uh, MoMA, PS1 uh, in New York. His work has been featured also in the New York Times, New York Post, the Huffington Post, etc. And you are also on the digital art community at Seacraft, where we met recently. Are you ready, Johannes? Almost. Well, let's roll the trip.
Thank you, Jorgen. Thank you, Birgitta, for inviting me to be part of this program. Um, I know that we are tight on time, so I'm going to dive right into this. Um, I have a, a project, a recent project, that I'd like to share with you today. Um, I'll start maybe the first half of the presentation showing the, the work and some of the process, and then um, the second half of the presentation I'll go into a bit of the um, historical and theoretical foundations for the work. So this is the Endless Mile. It's, uh, it takes the form of an infinite real-time procedurally animated scroll. Um, the scroll is an ancient form of storytelling as well, well as one that relates to cinematic actualities and computational platforms. So today I'll, I'll share aspects of the work and the process um, in addition to some of the, the research. And to help establish an aesthetic sense of the work, here are just a few minutes of um, brief video documentation. turn up the sound a bit.
So as you can see, the, the work is a very slow experience. Um, the Endless Mile is a computational artwork designed as an endlessly generative and procedurally animated video mural. In the context of its installation, the work is best experienced spatially at an architectural scale. That is to say, the surface of the, the video presents a kind of uh, wall of light, and the shadow play atop that wall of light acts as a kind of occluded light graffiti. The work's aesthetics utilize techniques in video, animation, and sound design, and its presentation is adaptable to a variety of contexts. Um, here you see just one, one example. Um, but this includes both screen-based displays and projection. However, despite the aesthetics, the work is actually designed as a computational program built upon a system of generative proceduralism. The underlying system randomly activates an index of prepared media, like animated looping elements, videos, and sounds, uh, as well as procedurally generated elements like um, sound, sounds or visual effects. And the most recent iteration of the project affords live audio input, allowing for direct audio lines from musicians or instruments, uh, as well as ambient audio uh, arrays or real-time speech detection. The aesthetic arrest of audiovisual content is uh, often misrepresents, uh, so the, the aesthetic arrest of audiovisual content sometimes misrepresents computational artworks as cinematic endeavors. And as I see it, these important underlying procedural aspects of this work actually have more to do with rules-based art practice than with cinematic storytelling, but I'll come back to that later. So before I dive into other aspects of the work, I just want to share a, a very short video of uh, documentation from another important and abiding aspect of my practice um, having to do with collaboration with live performance artists. In this video, you'll briefly see a procedurally animated moon that's activated by the sound of a tuba. And the tuba player's performance drives a kind of warbling transformation in the moon's animation. So you'll see layered video projection as well. That's a kind of homage to Stan Vanderbeek's movie mural. Uh, the animated collage is both figure and ground, like Hannah Hoek's uh, Dada collage from nearly 100 years ago. The tension between form and counterform remains vitally relevant for my practice in my work, um, both in its formal and metaphorical applications. These techniques are amplified when live performance is introduced. I'm happy to elaborate more on that later, but for now, here's the video.
So you can see quite a few people involved in a, a project like that. Um, animation is too often considered through the narrowing lenses of mass media entertainment. My re research is really interested in a longer continuum of animation as a philosophical inquiry. In their text, The Thousand Plateaus, Gilles Deleuze and Philux Guattari describe a line of becoming as a temporal state of perpetual transformation that affects all matter and being, a state that I find especially resonant in respect to animation. As they put it, a line of becoming has neither beginning nor end, departure nor arrival, origin nor destination. A line of becoming has only a middle. The middle is not an average. It is fast motion. It is the absolute speed of movement. Motivating the work's computational affordances are uh, historical and theoretical precedents related to shadow plays, scrolls, and phantasmagoric theater. Um, I'll share a few remarks about each of these um, to try to keep them brief, but to start with shadow play. In her essay, uh, The Puppet Theater and Plato's Parable of the Cave, Osley Goser describes pr uh, prevailing interpretations that have positioned the cave as a ubiquitous metaphor applied broadly to how we might view the effects of organized religion, the enlightenment, the political state, and hosts of other mediated communication apparatuses. Yet surprisingly, little scholarship has been made in respect to one of the most direct areas of interest, that of the shadow itself. As Goser notes, surprisingly little effort has been made to determine the precise form of art referred to in the image. The significance of the reference lies not just in the metaphysics of shadows, but more importantly in the aesthetic, thus ethical, triviality of this kind of theater for Plato. Plato's choice of shadow puppet theater heralds more than his now notorious attack on art because it singles out a peculiar form of comedy that embodies the burlesque, the vulgar, fantasy, and satire. So as Goser suggests, the, uh, the puppet theater in Plato's Allegory of the Cave must have been a direct reference to a kind of comedic theater appropriated from Aristophanes sometime around fourth century BCE. Perhaps we can see some of this evolution in, of, of that form in modern Greek and Turkish Karagioisis shadow plays. Karagioisis has a long tradition of political satire, employing flat two-dimensional puppets made from leather that utilize colorful and um, stylized silhouettes. Their exaggerated features, such as large eyes and distinctive bulbous shapes, contribute to the cartoonish and comedic nature of the performances. And it's not a far stretch to see how the shape language of cartoon character forms is detailed by someone like Preston Blair adhere to the principles of stylized silhouettes employed by many forms of shadow play. But the allegory of the shadow in the cave has an enduring global reach, one that posits the shadow as a politically cautionary tale, as well as a social critique and a testament to the powers of the imagination. Philosopher Gita Bord frames an interpretation of Plato's allegory in relationship to modern commodity culture, stating that in societies where modern conditions of production prevail, life is presented as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Everything that was directly lived has receded into representation. I find resonance in this um, quote with the ideas discussed in Dave Hickey's essay, Pontormo's Rainbow, where Hickey writes, quote, there's a vast and usually dialectical difference between that which we wish to see and that which we wish to see represented. The responses elicited by representations are absolutely contingent upon their statuses as representations and upon the knowledge of the difference between actuality and representation. So in a roundabout way, Hickey relates these ideas of um, representation and abstraction to both Jacopo Pontormo's paintings and Tom and Jerry cartoons. Uh, he recounts that when questioned in childhood by a school counselor about his relationship to cartoon violence, Hickey felt manipulated and betrayed, as if it was assumed that he couldn't tell the difference between cartoon violence and reality. In adulthood, he reflected on the situation to distinguish that between that which he wanted to see, um, in this case, the color and the movement of cartoon animation, and that which he wanted to see represented, the resilience of cartoon characters in the face of death. This dialectic um, uh, centering upon the relationship of abstraction and representation prevails in mediated cultural production. This is especially relevant in some of the most widely consumed animated forms in mass media entertainment today, which often favor exaggerated cartoon representation, both in movement and in form. 
as modes of succinct and easily understood visual language. Such exaggerated representations often yield unintended or overlooked effects of cultural flattening and stereotyping. Global shadow play traditions offer alternatives to this, ranging from the highly articulated acrobatic movements of traditional Chinese shadow play to the fully embodied forms of Indian and Cambodian shadow play to the highly stylized and multifaceted forms of Indonesian Wayang Kulet, Wayang Golek, and Wayang Beber traditions. Although varied in their forms and narrative techniques, each tradition uses shadow to activate and expand imagination through a collapse of representation and abstraction. So in particular, I'm drawn to examples of Wang Beber uh, theater, which shares uh, similarities with Wang Colette traditions, but its storytelling takes the form of a panoramic scroll. In Wang Beber and Wang Colette traditions, social context is shaped by a heritage of epic storytelling, in which the scroll provides a narrative apparatus for pictorial ballads presented by a socially revered Dalang. Uh, it's not uncommon that these stories could take many hours or days to unfold, and the audience relationship to the media is slow and patient. Uh, performances allow for audiences' casual social engagements, um, and the storytelling centers on well-known archetypes. Uh, this contrasted with practically any mode of communication in today's attention economy, um, you'll see the effective differences in social relations are noticeable in high relief. A recent study of user retention strategies by Chauncey Naiman exposes tendencies in addictive software design. The scroll has been instrumentalized for psychological effect. Tristan Harris, the co-founder and executive director of the Center for Humane T uh, Technology, likens addictive software design to the strategies of stage magicians, which, um, as, he, as he states, uh, start by looking for blind spots, edges, vulnerabilities, and limits of people's perceptions so they can influence what people do without them even realizing it. This tendency is commonly referred to as perception without awareness, and the techniques utilize design strategies that leverage sophisticated tactics to prey upon user psychologies. They manipulate desires by stimulating cravings via variable rewards or gamification. They activate feelings of duty and obligation to others via social reciprocity and user investment. And they prey on gullibilities via infinite scrolling or, or the illusion of choice. Despite this uh, critical contemporary framing, the scroll, has a long, the scroll has a long history of psychologically effective uh, narrative apparatus. Early cinematic actualities like the flying train are obviously absent an explicit story construct, but they're not without narrative or a distinct point of view. The Endless Mile is built upon a poetic combine structure akin to Robert Rauschenberg's um, artwork, The Quarter Mile or Two Furlong Piece, which spanned several decades in its creation. Rauschenberg's work takes the form of a thousand foot modular scroll and at the time of its making, Rauschenberg intended for it to be the longest artwork in the world. Its indexical mixed media approach is comprised of 190 panels and a variety of sculptural, electronic, and sonic combine elements. The artwork also provided a stage for live performance. The theatrical affordances in Rauschenberg's modular panorama recall earlier events in the history of the panoramic form, like the moving panorama. Historian Tom Gunning describes these were mounted on twin sets of rollers like gargantuan versions of uh, Chinese scroll painting. The moving panorama unrolled bit by bit, accompanied by music and a spoken lecture commenting on its views. Eschewing the total immersion of the 360 degree format, the moving panorama offered an ever expanding image presented, presenting a literal succession of views for a seated audience. And one critic described the spectacle as how to go 30 miles without moving at all. Coming to the end, um, Phantasmagoric Theater utilized uh, linear rail systems and focusable magic lanterns to create illusory spectral displays. Like the panorama, Phantasmagoria was entirely dependent upon custom-built and highly controlled architectural and technological apparatuses. Similarly, Phantasmagoria endeavored to abolish the pictorial frame. As art historian Noam Elmcott describes, the phantasmagoric device is one that sought spatiotemporal collapse between spectators and images, seemingly freed from their material supports. Put another way, the phantasmagoric device represents an apparent collapse between illusion and reality. 
This concept is drawn in contrast to the cinematic device which, in which media has an absorbing effect. That is, under the spell of cinema, uh, spectators lose their bodies to the story. Or as Elcott describes, cinema places us in the film by displacing us from the auditorium. The well understood politic of expanded cinema perceived the attenuating effects of cinematic storytelling and mediated communication as diluting imaginations and worldviews of popular audiences. In today's mass media entertainment, the side scroller and the endless runner are well known video game platforms, and the doom scroll is a well known phenomenon of lazy loading media feeds. With the endless mile, I'm interested in resurfacing the shadow and the scroll as expanded sites of contemplation, critical reflection, and phantasmagoric wonder. Thank you. I really tried. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Johannes. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Great references, historical references. Uh, I'm, I'm curious when uh, our time and space are blurring, so to speak, in this uh, uh, phantasmagoric uh, dispositif, in the scrolls. Uh, how do you handle narrative in your uh, projects and as well uh, in this format? Um, thanks for the question. The I, narrative is, is more about a, a distinct point of view, and so a lot of that goes into the index itself and build the, the build of the system um, and the design of how, um, say, a performer, a live performer is going to interact with it, or its installation, um, how someone might step in front of the frame and create a silhouette themselves, um, occluding light of the projection or um, of the light emissive screen. So there is, a, there is a narrative framework within the work, but there's not an explicit story. And um, that's something I, I, you know, with this particular project, I feel very strongly about. Um, in a way, I, I kind of think to, of the John Cage refrain, I have nothing to say and I'm saying it. It's a kind of minimalist um, endeavor and there's a, an emergent quality that happens with the work and, and people's interactions with it. Yeah, the idea, yeah and uh, the conversations of the people that are interacting with it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we have time for uh, uh, one question. Helen, two questions, yes. Hi, I really, really enjoyed your presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. And the work is really beautiful and mesmerizing. I have a technical question. Okay. <laughs> so it's a procedural uh, software um, that you input into a platform like Inky? It's actually built in the Unity real-time engine. Okay. And then it's, um, it's exported out of the Unity engine as a, as a software, an as an ac application. Okay, so, and, and so, so it's built in Unity, and then do you, so in Unity it's procedural, but if you're exhibiting it, you're exhibiting it as it's not going to be procedural. Is that right? It, it has affordances for real-time interaction. So it maintains, it, it is still procedural in the sense that there's an index underlying mm -hmm. the work, like there's a, a thousand elements, mm -hmm. and those elements will be randomly configured and spawned, and they'll live for a certain amount of time, and then they'll go away. Right. And then there's also an affordance for an interface, like okay. a, an audio interface. So a musician or um, even just like an ambient array of microphones could pick up like contact mics on a surface. Okay. And, and those could have um, attachments to objects within the frame or they could drive procedural elements got on you, top got of you, it. Got you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Last question. Maybe we can uh, start with uh, um, in the notebook. Also, I was very mesmerized by your presentation. Um, my curiosity is in the um, connection with the live performance and the musical instruments. And I'm interested in what kind of um, data you collected from these instruments. Like, for example, the tuba. Um, is it uh, loud, uh, soft, or is it, it can it be more complex? And that's, that's the, what I meant. The yeah. tuba was very simple. Um, the tuba was just the amplitude. So it's just the loudness. Um, with, I mean, there's certainly possibility to do more than that. 
And um, that's what I'm very interested in. This summer, they made a big breakthrough with the project to get uh, speech detection working. So um, words can be associated with specific animations in the index, or they could be associated with more abstract events, like procedural events that happen more spontaneously in real time. Um, and I have yet to see what that does. Um, I have two dates in December and then again in May where I will exhibit the work and then you know, hopefully realize some aspects of these kind of sound interactions further. It's, it's a field that I'm also exploring, so that's why I'm triggered by it. Well, we, we should talk then. <laughs> there is time. Uh, thank you so much. A thank big you. round of applause for Johannes. So we move on to the last presentation in this panel. Uh, Vavra and Mar is an artistic duo formed by Vavra Julia and Mar Canet Solar. In 2009, the artist duo's work is inspired by the information age. In their practice, they confront social changes and the impact of the technological era. In the past years, the artist too has concentrated on exploring creative AI and uh, yeah, you will tackle this in your presentation as well. Your work has been exhibited at many places, I will not count that. And uh, you are a professor at uh, the uh, University, Hong Kong University, and you are uh, right now finishing your PhD in Tallinn. So welcome and uh, let's roll the trailer. Yeah, thank you. Ah, oh, trailer, yes, sorry. <laughs> okay, so we are clearly on the on uh, sporting toward the end of the conference, as you see, and we are trying. I will try to be. Um, on time. Uh, so um, we are also clearly on expanded side of animation, but when we kind of started now to analyze our work, uh, we have quite a lot like um, animation uh, or, or desire to animate uh, uh, the visual aspect uh, of the work and also uh, audience in our work. So uh, we will tell you uh, today about our uh, new uh, artwork, which is a vision of destruction. Uh, but before that, we would like kind of to put it more into the context of our practice and also into the context of uh, uh, creative AI, what is um, uh, today affecting uh, quite a lot um, creative, like artistic field and also uh, uh, many artists are kind of wondering what they uh, what they can do with it in terms of uh, artistic tools. If if we talk about animation, this will be the first experiment that we did. This in 2009. Well, actually, it's not the first experiment because we did an, uh, a VR piece with Deep Dream, with uh, shot with two drones before. Uh, but this one was the first one that I think is the concept that we will kind of target today. That is animating the data set where uh, you build a data set and then uh, from there it comes uh, an animation. And this animation was at the beginning, we used Pro Gun and was one of the first guns and there was not a still a fluid way of navigating the latent space, it means that actually the animation was done from the process of learning of the model. And, and while it's learning, um, our data set, the data set was very important for us. It was a conceptual um, piece because like we were talking about where our waste of plastic is going. As you can see, the installation has four screens and, and this represents the four places where the plastic end up in our society. And, and the bottom up are plastic glomerates, that is the, one, the, the stones that are made in the deep sea uh, coming from the plastic that we throw and they end up there and with pressure they, they became stones in, in quite a relatively short time compared to many other ways of making stones. And then in the upper part are the landfills in the... Um, it's like, yeah, okay. all yeah, the but these are the details, I think. But the, um, uh, well, plastic land, it's also our aim was kind of a draw a parallel between uh, uh, AI and uh, the plastic. So if you know when plastic as material was invented, then it uh, it was kind of wonderful invention, which later on we understood how damaging it is for our planet. And we are asking if, if uh, 
what will happen with uh, with AI. So it's it's kind of everywhere. But but should it should it be everywhere? Maybe it would be as difficult to get <laughs> rid of it or the consequences as as the plastic. Uh, so the the other project when we of course came uh, style uh, style gun too. So from let's say uh, visual aesthetic uh, point of view changed uh, quite a lot of things, and we could kind of achieve to do more uh, smooth videos because uh, yeah, uh, I think just images AI generated images are very kind of artistically quite quite limiting for us at least. And uh, with a postcard landscape from Lanzarote 1 and 2, uh, we were uh, tackling uh, critical uh, tourism and uh, looking how digital image, their imagery and synthetic imagery uh, were in conflict uh, uh, with, uh, with the real uh, landscape and, uh, and geography. Um, but we will move on <laughs> because how we have... One, <laughs> okay, one, you want more? One thing okay. is that... The, the left is basically the view of the, um, the people who live in Lanzarote for long, means are images of the landscape with a human touch. And, and the right are a um, data set that we build of touristic images, all taken from Flickr. Um, and you can see that the learning uh, uh, process had actually, one, learned very much the, the landscape in huge detail. Uh, it's a volcanic island. Island means you will see that it has a roundish shapes, and this is actually how it is in real, also mm -hmm. the rocks. And in this one, uh, in the right side, is a lot of artifacts, but this is the state of mind of the tourists where they see really fast everything, and their memory is constructed in a very kind of chaotic way, and, and the memories are like a, a mix of everything that they had seen in one week, or even sometimes even less, uh, so, of uh, a lot uh, of places. Yeah, the videos are AI-generated, but we invited um, uh, different sound artists to do, to do for these videos a sound, but unfortunately, uh, we don't listen this uh, today, but uh, you are welcome to visit our website for that. Sorry, I have to be here a bad cop uh, <laughs> to keep the time. Uh, uh, so, uh, about the AI data sets, Mar, definitely yeah. want to do some, and say some words. In the, in the gun time, um, and not in one on the gun time, but um, at the beginning, um, like the data sets were very easy to make in a, in a small scale. And, but this has an artistic touch, very interesting, because the artist can create the data set and, and the outputs are not so diverse as uh, like the new models can make everything. But at the same time, time this narrowing down of the, um, of the outputs, it is much aligned of the artist's uh, message and what he wants to do. And, and this is a recent uh, paper um, by uh, some researchers, like explaining, and we took a quote that sometimes artistically it's not better to have um, a big data set, but the concept of a small data set where artists mm -hmm. curates everything and also might do also the data set mm -hmm. um, that is time consuming but also uh, very artistic in a way because can f focus in certain way oh, very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so uh, with this work, Dream Painter, finally we started kind of to feel at home with with these AI tools because we are not video artists and uh, we are not uh, also like photographers uh, uh, because we could do interactive uh, installation where then, uh, and of course again, the work has many layers. Uh, we can uh, talk about this uh, maybe also afterwards. Uh, and uh, the audience is uh, invited to uh, to tell a dream uh, in a natural language. So you just speak. You wait for a robot when it brings you a microphone, and then you say what which kind of dream you had last night. And uh, while putting away the microphone, uh, we calculate uh, what this. We actually transfer to text, and then text makes a line drawing. And that's how we do kind of a, uh, so to say, psychoanalysis of the dream and asking if we, even if we humans cannot understand the dream, what if um, AI and machine could understand? Uh, but yeah, in other actually, uh, other paper we are 
talking about the psychoanalysis on AI through, through this uh, human, human dream, so to say. And also for us here, it's very important the animation and also that the, the robot brings you the microphone to embody uh, the interaction to the robot. And also we use even the animation time to, that left the microphone to the, take the, the, the pen to kind of calculate all the AI in these 15 seconds of movement. Means the animation is embedded in the whole computation of, of flow of like the interaction and also kind of taking the delays of the computation. So we are in. choreographing uh, all all different technologies. What normally they are kind of standalone, but uh, the tricky part is to put. And, uh, and this is a little bit like the outputs that this uh, AI generates. Um, it actually doesn't work in pixel base. It, it works in 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 vector graphics. Uh, recently, we actually did. Um, we did a series of papers about this um, artwork, but this is the last one that actually we analyzed the outputs that this, and that this uh, installation had done in one of the exhibitions that we did in Lisbon in the ACM Multimedia. So when, that's when we do psychoanalysis on the clip, so to say. Yeah. When we are anal analyzing, and, uh, and what kind of like out. going to the perspective of the data set, this is trained on uh, is is using Clip, and Clip is this text to image data set encoder that has been trained and is behind all these uh, models that we use nowadays to text to whatever, text to image, text to video, text to um, mm -hmm. audio. Um, yeah. Yeah. So here in this graph, uh, I mean, we have another paper uh, talking about uh, all, uh, all these models through the practice-based uh, research. But what we want to show here is that there was a GAN era, <laughs> and now we are in the fusion era, which functions a bit differently, and it opens uh, new possibilities um, uh, for the artist, and, and also, I think, to talk uh, about the different uh, concepts which involve uh, real-time uh, generation or let's say navigation and uh, interaction uh, with these uh, models. Yeah. And more importantly is that these new um, division models are using large, large data sets and one of the one of these models is a stable diffusion and is the only one who we know the data set who is behind and is Lion and is 5 billion images, uh, text to image pairs and well, this is us, that we are in the data set. We know that we are in the data set. We're actually preparing a work that uh, talks about this, about if you are in the data set. But anyway, um, this is to explain that the, um, this data set is so big that it, it contains half of the internet of the visual imagery, as well as is, um, is a compression. It's so compressed because it's four uh, gigabytes. And in there is, is so much history of the past that that is what we're using in our in, in our new piece. Yeah. So if there are so many images already, so it's sometimes we think like why we need to create a new one. So just uh, let's ask what is there and how we how we can uh, create uh, uh, new ways of kind of exploring uh, this vast imagery and maybe also uh, collaging it uh, together in uh, in real time. Uh, so this is a vision of destruction. And uh, it's a short demo video where you can uh, see also uh, what is happening. Yeah, Vision of Destruction is a new interactive piece of us um, that creates always like outstanding, beautiful landscapes. Um, that as soon as uh, some viewer start to look the landscape, will start to pollute um, the landscape. We're using eye tracking system to detect which areas uh, the um, the viewer uh, has, uh, is looking at this time, and, and then we will uh, transform in different ways uh, this landscape uh, in human uh, transformation of the landscape, like um, either houses or landfills or um, industrial complexes. So here you can see a technical uh, view um, where, where then the gaze goes. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, let's say um, array or uh, or the list of uh, of prompts which which we input, and then uh, we are kind of uh, our viewer is uh, creating uh, these uh, transformations which we kind of uh, pre pre curate so to say, but again we never know like. Uh, 
we we kind of know what is happening, but exactly it's it's never impossible um, to to kind of. Uh, uh, predict and uh, certain certain landscapes uh, they change faster, certain uh, landscapes uh, slower. So first maybe the gaze is moving mountains around, then it's uh, building uh, the roads, then some houses, then more houses, factories. I mean, in the end, it's kind of retelling the story of uh, humanity, how we have been uh, uh, transforming uh, um, the. Uh, the nature, and uh, and which which cannot uh, anymore, of course, uh, go uh, to the to the same state uh, back. And conceptually, we are talking about the destruction of uh, terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, there is a lot of uh, studies that we are uh, by far uh, accelerating and never never stopping this destruction of the terrestrial ecosystems. Um, we destru destroying also the marine ecosystems, but the terrestrial because we live in the air, in the earth, we even more. And and this uh, all these images that that is being produced, we don't have fully control. We guide the, how how it's getting generated, but. Uh, it is an emerging system generative and always is, this, is different. Mm -hmm. And also because the areas that the eye look um, is very unpredictable and it all depends what the, the users do, uh, it also will produce mm -hmm. that this uh, navigates into the latent space of the AI in very uh, different ways and, and, and will generate uh, very um, aleatory outputs o o on it. But at the end, it is talking about all this also awareness of like what we are doing to the to the earth and to the terrestrial ecosystems means um, and is uh, how you see in the video is um, is how it, it behave in real time um, the 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 green areas this is not seen by the the, spec the viewers of the installation just like to understand what is internally going on. I think we are more or less on time, or over time. <laughs> I can think maybe some questions. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, great to see that uh, uh, you are tackling uh, um, um, urgent topics mm -hmm. and you are using a lot of um, um, technology, robotic. Uh, uh, um, interaction, uh, AI, gaze interaction. I was wondering when uh, I think about the last project, uh, so uh, how is it received by the audience? Is it more a playfulness? Uh, um, it's fun to create uh, objects with the gaze, like uh, a brush, uh, uh, or is there, um, has it an impact? Uh, the critical perspective so yeah, this is it's so this new project that uh, it hasn't been exhibited yet so it would be uh, it opens uh, on saturday <laughs> in our solo show will be part uh, of it so it's uh, we are also curious uh, to find out but from kind of we have uh, experienced and experimented and tested like a lot this and uh, uh, and and it's it's actually fascinating. Uh, from one side, it's like fascinating to see like how from from one one in, because the thing is like if nobody's there, it's just like interpolates from one um, uh, landscape to another, like without any uh, destructive elements. Let's say like this. Uh, uh, and we didn't mention, but it regenerates when no one is looking. Yeah, at, yeah. At so it's uh, it's cons and. Um, and then when you start looking at it and then when you th and when you finish your interaction then you can't remember anymore from where you started and and then uh, yeah at least for me it's like actually it's 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 exactly like this what is is now like we we don't even remember how it is to be without uh buildings and noise and cars around and uh, and so on. I, I mean, I, ho I hope at least that people kind of stop and think like, okay, how we got from from this to here? Mm -hmm. yeah. And the speed is actually accelerating. Okay, I think there is time for question. Um, 
Just a quick question, because you were doing that timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know a work called by Joachim Sauter called the Zelsea? I think it actually was a golden Nika, maybe even. It's about destructing images with your eye tracking. Could you, do you, can you compare what you've done and what you've done back in like mm -hmm. early 90s, I think? You remember this yeah, one? Yeah, it's out yeah, there. The, so the, the one, the one with the um, with the painting. Yeah, yeah, it's an inspiration. Yeah. This one. So, yeah, yeah, okay. At the beginning, I thought that you said Salter, but it's there's, there's Salter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jack and Salter. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he, well, but he but let, let's say like the techniques that the, the available right now, like they're really, I mean, they're really transforming the, the aesthetics and so forth. So just mm -hmm. to comment on the past and now and mm -hmm. what's possible. Yeah, I mean, the, this, this, this piece is definitely a, a, a reference to us, and, and when we are preparing the, the paper uh, that will come some this year or beginning of next year, it is in one of the, the our reference points, of course, yes, yes. Um, like the parallels, um, as far as I understand, I mean, it's, it was not a generative system, like the, it was not making new um, paintings all the time. Uh, in our case, um, for us, the conceptual is, for example, a lot of kind of speculating and, and revisiting what is in the Lion data set. Um, means it's a way of kind of um, revisiting the harm that we had done in our planet that is stored in, in, the, in the data set. Um, and yeah, the interaction system I am very happy that we now have um, this, this kind of device, is Toby, is a Toby device, uh, the one we use, is actually target for gaming. Um, in theory, by, by their um, how of contract that you, when you need to sign to start to use it, um, they say you cannot store the gaze, and it's actually only for interaction, and we only use it for interaction. We, we don't um, save anything, and it's extremely fast, uh, the, and precise, the, the place that you look. Um, I'm, I'm surprised um, every time I see the video with Sauter how they, they did that. I didn't experience it, I don't know if it really was mm. accurate um, because mm -hmm. um, years ago I used, to ha I used to develop the Toby version, that, uh, like one installation that was down in the main hall during 2009 until the change to AI. And, and that needed calibration and so on. Means um, I don't know how that was working really. But anyway, what I can say, this one, it works without mm -hmm. calibration. Um, in theory, it works better if you calibrate, but I have been using and testing in the lab and with different people, and it, it gets really well with uh, everyone, as soon as you are in the right place. Mm. Okay, uh, I think one question, then we have to close. Um, could you say, um, what's your feeling about um, the, the wow effect from the audience? Uh, the user is always linked to the eye technology. We observed in the last year, they just go down very impressively because, of course, everything is uh, Photoshop. Or, you know, when technology goes to Photoshop, it becomes uh, a commodity. And now the challenge for artists is to do a storytelling. They become more interesting, complex, like the beautiful one about the microphone that was coming to the, not this scenographer rule, become probably now more important compared to last year, because uh, uh, for obvious reason, uh, day after day, they introduce this technology inside to tool that are very common and popular. So and our rule become a little bit different, not just introduce the last technology available, but try to find a storytelling that really can seduce you know, the audience. So what's your impression about that? You feel this pressure of way to change mentality when you're building a new art piece that come from industry that move so quickly and introduce, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> I can try that's to answer. But cool. yeah, yeah, we know, we know that. Um, that's why, for example, this now uh, AI videos, like thanks to some tools, like for example, uh, runway ML and, and so on, uh, this will be mass use uh, or is mass use already for many people. Um, although uh, I will say that there is not so much interactive uh, AI mm. installations. Uh, they are very complex to do. I, I know because I, we have built some. And, and I, I'm, I'm doing my PhD in the field and I know exactly the number of uh, AI installations that they have been produced over the last years. I mean, one is down Memo Atkin, uh, Learning to See, and uh, Mario Klingerman had, had done Coppel. 
and, and there is really like with the number of fingers, uh, the AI installations that there is. Like, I mean, not, not number of fingers, but I mean like, I would say that I will be doubting that the right to 50. I think by heart I, I can mm -hmm. list about 20 or 30, at least the prominent ones that have been um, publishing. Um, which means that it's more rare and it's more valuable, I guess, when you kind of build it in a system that is like a yeah. generative. And yeah, maybe I can also answer. I mean, we are at the point that finally we we feel like, okay, we can, um, we can produce the work which we recognize more ourselves as an artist because before it was like we have done like videos with AI and so on and I always felt it's not me. And now finally there is, that's why I, I wouldn't say like I fetishize technology like going for the last uh, tools and I think we even enhance those last tools but I feel like okay finally I can realize my imagination that I just don't want only to look the images and videos, but I want to kind of uh, give certain kind of surprise and, and discovery and also feel this uh, effect like um, that artists are maybe not even creating the imagery anymore, but giving you uh, experience of exploring, maybe also reply uh, to, um, to LP about, about the earlier work, is, is the context is a bit different because the thing is also what we are talking about here is all this vastness of this data set what is built on uh, the AI and, and you also see some kind of uh, you know, mistakes and how, how, how these big models understand the catastrophe and, and, and one, what, what they think, what is the beautiful landscape. In the end it's kind of very kind of general or, or average understanding of humanity. So it's kind of a bit like a mirror or a broken mirror in a way which you can navigate and, and play. And, and this is uh, exciting for us as an artist uh, because we can, we can really um, uh, develop this, this new, new experiences uh, for us and uh, for the yeah, audience. Yeah, and research the uh, systems of Unfortunately, <laughs> I have to yeah. stop yeah, let's this go for a drink very <laughs> urgent discussion. So uh, we have... Uh, but thank you for a lovely question. Yeah. Thank, thank you. A big round of applause for uh, Vavra and Ma. We will continue at 5 p.m. with the keynote, uh, so uh, enjoy the short break. <laughs>